Today we're talking about the psychology of leadership, of concepts that have, have gained steam, like psychological safety and a growth mindset. But we're also talking about an in-the-trenches reality of leading for control and compliance or leading for commitment. We're talking about all this as a way to help us understand ourselves better and lead better. Welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast, where we are helping leaders like you grow personally and professionally to lead more effectively and make a bigger difference for their teams, organizations, and the world. If you're listening to this podcast in the future, you could join us live on your favorite social channel. Uh, you can get all of ex access to those future episodes, links to when they're going to happen, the calendar of when they're going to happen, so that you can interact with us and, and see this content sooner uh, by joining our Facebook or LinkedIn groups, just two of the social channels that we happen to operate these live casts on. Uh, you can go to our uh, to join our Facebook group by going to remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook or go to remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn. Get you all the details, get you up to date. And I hope that you'll do that and join the hundreds of people that are on those two groups. Today's episode is brought to you by our Remarkable Masterclasses. Pick from 13 important life and leadership skills to help you become more effective, productive, and confident while overcoming some of the leader's toughest challenges. Learn more and sign up at remarkablemasterclass.com. Our guest today is Skip Bowman. You probably know that. You've read something that told you that. I'm going to bring him in and then I'm going to introduce him. There he is. Let me introduce Skip to you and then we're going to dive in. Uh, Skip Bowman is an author, consultant, and keynote speaker focusing on how to transform organizations to the green economy with a growth mindset and psychological safety. He grew up in Perth, Australia, has spent most of the last 25 years working in Switzerland, England, France, and Denmark. After studying finance in Australia, he attained his MA in psychology and languages in Copenhagen. He also has a master's in organizational psychology and completed additional training in cross country, excuse me, cross cultural management, group dynamics, coaching, and cultural change. His book, Safe to Great, which if you're watching, I'm holding up. Safe to Great, The New Psychology of Leadership outlines his new psychology for leadership and an integrated process for implementing a growth mindset based on psychological safety in organizations. And he is our guest, and I'm glad he's here. Skip, welcome. <laughs> I'm great to be here, Kevin. I'm glad you, uh, you're happy that I'm here. We had a couple of technical difficulties, but I'm so glad we sorted it out. Thank you so we much. Got it here. And, uh, we got a couple of folks from my team who are here. I'm not going to put their names on the screen, but if, if you're here live, please let us know, say hello. And as we're going along, have, have a question, go ahead and ask us. So, so Skip, I want to dive in and I want to find out like, um, sort of tell us about your journey in, in short, really, how did you end up getting to this idea? And we'll talk more about what it means in a minute. How did, how did you get to this place called safe to great? Like, tell us the journey that leads you from Perth, to Europe, to doing this kind of work. Yes, in one minute or less. Uh, exactly. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, Australian, I, I love diving, uh, underwater diving, that is, uh, as a young kid. And I became a diving instructor in the early, uh, late 80s, early 90s. And I discovered that being a great diver didn't mean anything if you were trying to teach people to dive. Uh, so I discovered that sort of, being a great instructor was about making people feel confident and competent. And to do that, it was fundamentally some sort of magical sort of connection that you create between people. And this is my first experience. I mean, I grew up at school and university. I never really thought about it. But when I suddenly got that job and I loved it. I loved teaching and I loved, you know, instructing. I suddenly realized that there was something special. If you made that connection, you could do something great. If you didn't make that connection, it was really, really difficult. And and it went on to later in life where I learned languages. I learned Danish. I learned French. I uh, moved to different cultures, uh, studied psychology, etc. So many of those successes uh, are to do with the relationships that we have. And and that has really driven why I've got a book in which you've, I'm very happy to see you bought. Appreciate that. Um, which is growth mindset from a relational perspective. How do we help? How do we grow, but how do we help others grow? So it started off as diving, but it's led on to my whole professional career, 25 years in leadership and organizational development. Um, and I've seen that so often ignored uh, at your peril. 
Uh, and when it's there, we get this multiplier effect. When the relationships are right, we can grow. And so that's what the book is dedicated to. So, uh, and that's, and, and, and a story, everybody, when you get your copy, which I hope that you will do, uh, there's a longer story about this connection to diving that Skip tells in the beginning of the book. Uh, I, I love that you start there, though, Skip, because uh, the connection between being an instructor, a teacher, whatever word you want to use there, and being a leader, they're connected. And they're connected uh, they're connected because as leaders, we are coaches and we are often teaching people things for sure. But I think they're connected. And I, I think that we are of similar mind here that they're connected in, in, in deeper ways than that. Like some instructors say we're going to lecture and it's pretty much one way. And some leaders kind of do the same. Uh, we're going to head to all of that in a second. But do you have anything else you want to say about the connection between leading and teaching? I'm just curious. Oh, I think there's an emotional connection. Um, I mean, you're standing on the edge of a boat and you've got all this dark water in front of you and you're about to roll into shark infested waters. There's a certain look you have in each other's eyes. There's a certain grabbing onto each other's shoulders before you dinner. And they're wonderful metaphors for what is called in another great book, which is called Care to Dare, that when we show that we care about somebody, it creates a foundation for doing something difficult. Now, in that case, it was rolling off a, a, a boat into the water, but it could be at work, trying something difficult, learning something new, taking a risk, all those kinds of things. That if we know there's somebody behind us who's taking care of us, who, who kind of no matter what, is going to continue to care and want us to learn and develop but that that makes all the difference that's like that's the magic that's the magic dust right so i hinted at it if people are watching they see it next to your name safe to great um what's the basis what's underneath this this approach this new psychology of leadership that we're going to talk about today that you call safe to great what's the basis of that approach well, essentially, if we want to put some theory on that idea about that connection, um, we're going to put psychological safety on it. That's the big term that Amy Edmondson sort of helped us out with. She's not the first person, but certainly has made it extremely popular uh, and super relevant. And so safety becomes this a concept that can say to something about this. Once we create that, it's kind of like the foundation. And the reason is really simple is if you studied psychology of leadership and performance, what we know is that when people are operating in what we might call an unsafe or a fear zone, they're not very successful. They might be able to do things that are quite dramatic and powerful, but it doesn't lead to real sort of growth and learning. We tend to be using our survival instinct rather than using anything that's really clever, right? So unless we create that safety and and to use lots of examples of people who've done extraordinary things under great duress, now, if that could be, you know, in, in accidents around aircraft or it could be like even the, the terrible World Trade Tower events. These are similar events. If we really look into the detail, there are great stories about people, everyday people, but also leaders who step into extraordinary situations and create just enough level of safety that people are willing to do and to achieve extraordinary things. Because what happens is instead of us being fearful we are able to step out of that and to be able to start thinking and using our resources, but most importantly, to collaborate. That's where the gold is. You know, it's when we work together that amazing things happen, whether it's on a basketball team or whether it's in a fireman's team or whatever, it's the same challenge. So it unlocks everything. If you look at a great book is, is about the culture code written by Dan Coyle. Um, fabulous book again about the power. When we belong to something, we have a common trajectory and we create safety, we're then able to do magical things together. And his study of in so many different high-performance contexts shows that we always say, oh, you need emotional intelligence. No, what we need is that sense of caring and that safety has to be in play because when it's there, we can really challenge hard. Now, that's the logic of safe to grade. Um, now, psychological safety by itself is not enough. We need something that stretches us, right? both relationally and in terms of getting the job done, the task. And that's where growth mindset, that's where Carol Dweck's work gives some insight into what that could look at. But, but obviously, that is a concept that Carol Dweck developed in educational settings, like learning at university. What I spent the last seven years is being able to say, 
how could we use our existing theory and empirical studies of, of performance at work to be able to say something meaningful about what growth mindset really is in practice? So how do we create that stretch in terms of relationship, in terms of task, get these, you know, to lift us not just above what we might call our comfort zone, to lift us into a learning zone, but also lift us into a growth zone of some sort. That, that's quite a remarkable thing. And great teams do it. You know, Dan Cole talks in the Culture Code about the SEALs. They do it. You know, some great basketball teams do it. I think it's back to this idea that greatness is quite rare, right? There's a lot of ordinaries out there and there's an awful lot of crap, right? Um, not to mention some really toxic stuff as well. But we're, we're trying to be inspired by what really great teams and, and try to then break it down to a set of principles so you can sort of say, we need more of this. But I think where the, the big difference in my work is I also look at the dysfunctional stuff. We have to understand that part of the reason we don't succeed is there are things holding us back, right? And that can be in us and it can be around us. And those things matter when we're starting to have that calculation about is there a growth mindset or not? So that's part of the learning that's put into that book. So uh, in the book, you, you just hinted at it a little bit, Skip. When you, you say, in the book, you call it the, the bright side and the dark side. Uh, uh, what sits what this sits on. And, and this gets to, as I promised in the open, that we get a, a bit of an understanding about ourselves and how we can move forward. And so in the book, you talk about bright side, dark side. Today, we're going to start with the dark side. Um, so uh, not just because I think it'll, it'll make more sense for our conversation, because one of the things that happens uh, and and one of the things I, I loved about the book is that we use you and I use some very similar language when we when we work with leaders, and um, you 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 have a section. It's about halfway through the book where you talk about the dark side, and one of the things you talk about is leading for control. And, and so we often talk about it leading for compliance, but we're talking about exactly the same thing, yeah. right? Um, and, and so my question is, why do leaners? leaders lean into control like why is that so prevalent and why it because here's what i know and everyone and first of all skip the people who are watching and listening are probably doing this less right we're 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 we're, we're talking to people who are working hard to get better uh and yet all of us have leaned here and all of us have had a leader that leaned here and said and we said i don't want to do that necessarily and yet we do. Why do we lean into control, which you're, you're, you're calling the dark side? There's a there's an evolutionary factor, right? Um, and we're just wired for it. And that's a pity. <laughs> but it worked 40, 50, 100,000 years ago. Our brain hasn't changed much since then. Um, so in reality, most great leadership is overcoming natural instincts. And, and that's it. Because what worked to save you from the from the saber-toothed tiger isn't very effective to understand the complexities of a supply chain meltdown post-COVID. They're two very, very different tasks. Um, and the kind of cognitive complexity, et cetera, that you need to solve the, the, the latter is very, very different. So we have to sort of, get over the fact that that instinctively we look up to control, particularly when we're faced by uncertainty and challenge, right? We tend to say, oh, let's find the hero. Let's find, you know, as I I say, I said elsewhere, let's find Bruce Willis. Let's let's find let's find the guy who's going to get us out of this stuff. Um, great respect to him. He's a wonderful guy, I'm sure. But, but we want the hero, right? And that's how we're primed. That's part of our, you know, evolutionary makeup. Then we've got another factor, which is that, in terms of the way organizations tend to make choices about who leads, um, who they choose for project leadership, who they choose for line leadership, directors, et cetera, tends to be people who exhibit behaviors that we call the alpha male position. So charismatic, dominant, controlling, right? Because they seem like the right things to have. That's, that's an enormous bias that we have in organizations. Because when you actually look and measure it, great leaders don't really look like that at all. <laughs> Um, they're actually much more humble. They've got a determination. They've got other qualities. And, and that's primarily too, because, you know, I don't want somebody who can defend me against a saber-toothed tiger. I'm actually trying to find somebody who can help me, um, you know, 
manage something like the inflation problem in North America or help us you know, get off gas in, in Europe because you know, that leads to the kind of conflicts we have today. So these are very complicated issues that require leaders of different, you know, with, with a different kind of greatness. Um, and I think we often need to challenge it. So there's the human bias, but there's an organizational bias towards what I call hippos, which I've got a badge wearing, you know, uh, you know leaders that are controlling. Um, so that'd be the main reason. And because we face uncertainty, we saw it recently, which is kind of amusing, you know, in the face of where do we go with social media, Mark Zuckerberg and, and Elon Musk wanted to have a cage fight. <laughs> it can't Is be a that not going to happen now? I don't know. Like, I you think it would be fantastic. Conversation on the 20th of November. It's not going to come. This isn't going to come live on the podcast until the 24th of 2024, of January of 2024. So I don't know. But I haven't heard anything about it in a while. Is it off? I don't know. But it's it's remarkable. It's it's because when, when, when stock. Oh, we lost Skip. Hard wrestlers. <laughs> it's 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 funny like that, but that's a little bit how the world the world works in uncertainty, and we're facing a lot of that right now, right? It's you know if we're looking at the traditional understanding of business planning, the level of uncertainty means that most companies are not comfortable with a plan longer than six months. Boy, oh boy, we've never seen anything like that, right? So that means that. Everyone is looking for something that looks more certain and, and the human characteristics we like to look for. And that's why the growth mindset principle in my book is fundamentally um, counterintuitive. It's in fact, you don't want Bruce Willis. <laughs> you actually want somebody who looks quite different to that. Yeah, because what happens is, and is that because we're looking for that certainty, then we look to someone who seems certain. Um, yes which takes us back to where we just were. So what are the what are the costs to us as organizations if we lean into or promote uh, or search for that person leading from the place of control? The, the, the primary one is that when, when we sort of face a leader who's overly coercive and dominant, et cetera, we tend to adopt a coping strategy or a resisting strategy, right? Now, a coping strategy tends to look like this. My boss is really aggressive and dominant and after me. Uh, so what I do, I'm going to be nice to her, right? I'm going to be friendly. I'm going to do what they say. But in principle, when I face uncertainty, I'm going to wait and see. I'm going to follow the rules. I'm going to be really cautious here, right? Yeah. And what we know from research into that, that's a really bad position just about any kind of business. I'll go back. There is a there is a slightly different alternative to that, but so that we cope with that. The second position, which is pro, which is worse from an effectiveness point of view, is we resist. In other words, we start to yeah, we start to complain and bitch and whine and and you know, aggressive. yeah, we do all those things to try to get away with it. You know, to try to resist that that unfairness that comes with it in various different ways. The research is really simple, but in shops around America, right, if you measure the level of pilfering, you know, in other words, losing stock, you then correlate it to the level of toxicity of the leader. How controlling are they? And there's a correlation. So what we realize is the majority of people who steal in shops are the staff themselves because they're trying to write the balance of, of feeling, you know, unjustly treated. And that really matters. That's just an example of it. So, and so if we want to collaborate, if we want to do high quality, if we want to innovate, I need people to not, you know, be scared about my boss. I need them to be focusing their attention on solving the task. So what happens with controlling leaders? Everyone's only worried about what the leader's thinking, not what the customer's thinking or the, what they're right. thinking together. Yeah. And so the goal becomes satisfying the boss or keeping there being pain there as opposed to solving the real business problem uh, or yeah. me meeting the real op opportunity. So I framed this conversation, Skip, around leaning toward control. Uh, so if we're not leaning that direction, what are we leaning toward? Like you, you've, you've sort of helped us see that while it's natural and it's understandable, it's not very effective to always lean toward the control side. So what's the other alternative? The alternative is what I call the commitment premium or the commitment method, right? And that's essentially based on a concept called autonomy enhancing in the sense that 
we're trying to if i if i say to you hey what do you think kevin as opposed to saying kevin do this what happens is i i create the possibility of you saying oh i like the bit where you ask me what i think and what we know from research is that that has a profound impact on on teams on individual contributors everything because it, just small amounts of 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 autonomy small amounts of choice mean that I perform better. I think better. I relate to people better. I'm more resilient. Um, you know, I'm less likely to have stress. These things really matter. And they're relatively small choices. But that small act of saying, what do you think, Kevin? Or, Kevin, I've seen this. It's really cool. Can we do more of it? Small change. Uh, but it's we're talking about a performance premium that's like 40 to 50%, right? It's It's really valuable. And that's the that's the thing which most people don't want to admit. Um, and if you look at the research done by loads and loads, and, we, and this is not research new, it's been around for a really long time. Right? right. This is not new, right? It's just become increasingly hard with the business models that we have today to be really effective with a control model. So commitment is actually becoming increasingly necessary and increasingly important. But I'll, as I get back to, there's a small thing which I talk about in the book is our philosophy is we want to continue to manage one to one. In other words, we want to manage individuals rather than thinking about how do we manage relationships between people. And that's that's a real shift in the safe to great model. And if you look again at the research, the leaders that understand that, uh, for example, Pixar's you know, uh, Ed Catmull, he understands that his job is not is to lead the system. <laughs> he understands that really well. Uh, and that's what turned around, you know, well, created Pixar, but then turned around Walt Disney. It's a fantastic story, but it's very clever stuff. He's not trying to lead it like a hero. He leads it in a fundamentally different way by creating a healthy uh, system relationships that create the success that they get. Well, it's like, you know, you hire smart people. So then you need to unleash them. And if you bring in smart people, uh, then why wouldn't you want to do that, right? Ultimately, when it's all said and done. Um, but you make so them dumber with controlling leadership. That's the thing we know. <laughs> so it's really curious. But anyway, keep going. I'm up for your question. No, no. So um, what's... So people that are listening, watching, are saying, I'm with you, Skip. I get it. Um, I don't want, to, I want to overcome nature uh, and not necessarily lead from the place of control. Where where should people start? Like, obviously, we want them to go buy a copy of your book, Safe to Great. I'm talking to Skip Bowman, the author of Safe to Great, The New Psychology of Leadership. Uh, but where do people start? Like, what should they do first? Depends on who you are. In the book, I'm going to talk about protected mindsets um, as being the different, you know, we operate generally fairly protectively mindset wise, you know, risk averse, fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of loss, et cetera, right? So we tend to be very more predicted, protective than you might think. Even bossy people are essentially being protected because bossy people are scared of relationship. So they're protecting something, which is their independence. So, you know, it's, it's similar. And it makes you feel strong to certainly strong or slash safe, um, you know, invulnerable, perhaps, are words you could use there. Um, so where do you start? The start is working out where you lie in that sort of, in this world of fight, flight, freeze. Are you somebody who, when faces uncertainty protectively, you tend to take control? If that's your journey, then the, 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 like, like for that matter, in the fantastic book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Mr. Covey will have said, it's a, such a such an amazing book. We, I've, I've been in this business for a long time. I still think that's a great book. And it was written a really long time ago. But his point was, if you have an independent voice, which is somebody who does have fight, right, When the, you need to have a public victory. You've got to learn to work well with others. He's absolutely right, okay? If you're, if you're somebody who's struggling with assertiveness, tends to want to belong to the group, wants to value relationships, and struggles to find their own voice, you need to have the private victory, as he would call it. You've got to learn to be able to speak your mind, to hold accountable, to set goals. Uh, so th you have to know that. I have a third position, which isn't really in, in his stuff, which I call the clam, uh, which is a critical skeptical position. Um, and, and in this position, we actually have to do two things. One, you have to believe that you can set a positive goal and achieve it. And secondly, you have to stop being so bloody suspicious of everyone who's around you because this is a very ineffective position to be in. Quite a lot of really clever people can be here, but 
once we know where you are, we can sort of start working on how do we bring together your ability to care and to dare. In other words, to have that optimal combination of support and challenge in the way that you work together with others and the way you lead. But it's not one size fits all. I, I challenged um, uh, uh, Adam Grant, who writes a lot on Instagram recently, et cetera, where he was saying, you know, we just need humility. And I'm saying that's really good advice for somebody who's a hippo, who's very controlling and dominant, but it's not good advice for somebody who's struggling with assertiveness. That, right. That's because not it. The, the, the opposite ends of the spectrum. And so that's that really is great advice on one end. It's 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 the opposite of what's needed on the other end, really. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we all yeah. need to be hum humble, but if humble, if humility becomes every strength overdone is a weakness, right? And, and, yeah. and so I think it's really a really excellent point. So in the world that we live today, uh, you know, in a post COVID world uh, where so many more people are working uh, not in proximity yeah. as were before. I mean, that trend would have continued anyway, but we, we mashed the accelerator on that and didn't send everybody back uh, in every, in every organization. So my question is, how is all of this harder now? Like, what would you, what would you say to those? Like everything you said applies whether people come together every day or whether they don't. But what would you say specifically to those who are leading at a distance that they want, might want to be aware of in relationship to safe to great? It depends on if you're the, if you're the leader at the distance at the office or the leader at the distance at home. <laughs> I'd actually prefer you to be the one at home. Um, the best thing about leadership is make the leader slightly weaker. That's always a good thing, um, because the at, <laughs> at the office you're going to be the king queen of all things, uh, whether you like it or not. Um, and even if you're not, you're perceived as so. Of course, this is it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's back to the the sort of survival evolutionary thinking that we have, you know, we so it's what they call the, the seals call and the call the authority bias. It's really, and if the seals experience it, everyone does because they're the toughest people in the whole world. Right. Um, so it really matters there. Hybrid's a super curious thing. Um, we're evolving to it. Uh, there's some technical issues. In other words, humans, humans grow up with a certain distance between, between, between us, like only about a meter in our intimate relationships. So right. working with cameras is really tricky, like like you and I are trying to do here. Um, so our ability to sort of on a, what we call micro behavioral level to build trust is quite difficult. Yep. Uh, there's also the time lag problem that voice and sound are slightly lagged, uh, which isn't good for us because we're not trained for that. Our, our brain becomes tends to feel <laughs> suspicious when we have a gap between sound and vision. So there's a lot of things at a micro level that are really tricky here. So the only way to solve that is, again, to go bold in, right? If you're going to go bold on virtual leadership, one, you need a good camera. <laughs> you need some good lighting. Uh, you look amazing, by the way. And that really matters because I can build trust to you because you're being vulnerable in the way you're lit because I can see you. I can, and I've met lots of leaders who seem to be doing their, like the Dark Lord out of Star Wars, right? It's yeah, like, yeah. They, it's in, like they in, put uh, a hood on. <laughs> yeah, in witness, <laughs> witness protection, right? Um, yeah. So I want to shift gears, Skip, before we sure, finish with a couple of different kinds of questions. Um, we've talked a lot about um, psychological safety. We've talked a lot about growth mindset. And so I'm curious. It's actually a question I ask all of my guests, but I think it may be especially of interest given what our conversation has been. Uh, what do you do for fun? <laughs> You're asking an author. What? <laughs> You're also asking an author has three children under the age of three and a half. Um, well, so that's part of what you do. Hopefully, at least yeah. part of it's fun, right? Yeah, yeah. Kids. yeah, yeah, no. I mean, this is, you know, personally speaking, um, I think one of my, yeah, I don't really have, ho I have a hobby, which is I, my wife and I bought uh, an old French farm some uh, three or four years ago. And we're renovating it. So we've turned it into a place you can rent out. Um, and that was just a project. I mean, we love, and people say, oh, is that a business set? Well, I don't know. I mean, I wanted to learn French again. Uh, I wanted, I love old buildings. So there you go. So for me, you know, 
and and of course with the three ki- small kids you know we're, we're trying to build up a whole world around that and and so i'm i'm in dad mode and so that's pretty much what i what i spend and, and enjoy a lot uh because to me spending time with the kids trying to trying to renovate learn french these are things that i for me challenge is a hobby i just you know i can't you know i, I i'm not very good on the sofa i i mean i might watch cricket because i really like that game but, but but in principle i'll i'll start thinking about okay what could we renovate here so i have a life that is is authorship and researching my next book etc but otherwise i love uh, i love projects learning french is one of them uh learning everything about you know old buildings and architecture that's that's something i do i just my brain just loves learning i just love that i can't i can't resist it so so in in all of that uh you did you did sort of end with i love learning so reading is one of the ways we learn what's something skip that you've read recently or maybe that you're reading right now i'd have to say um I reread Dan Daniel Coyle's The Culture Code. I can really recommend that book. I think it's a great book. The, the the funny thing is, is he actually refers to other researchers and writers, and I actually think he tells the story better. <laughs> so it's a bit, you know, there's some really good authors out there like Amy Edmondson, but to be honest, I think Dan Coyle, Coyle tells the story about her research almost in a more more intriguing way. I think it's a fantastic book. I would highly recommend it. Uh I, I bought it for my wife, who's just started a new role as a leader. Uh, so I said, you have to read this. This is such a good book. It's such a good, well-told story, and it's very solid research, and I can't recommend it higher than that. Best uh, book I've written in, read in a while. Daniel Coyle, The Culture Code, and Skip Bowman, Safe to Great, The New Psychology of Leadership. So, Skip, where do you want to point people? Where can they learn more about your work? And that sort of thing. I'm pretty lucky that Skip Bowman is a pretty unusual. You can you can get you'll find me or a previous uh, vice admiral of the nuclear fleet in America. <laughs> so that is it, not you. No, it's not me. We're no, not both of but you. Thing. Yeah, but so Skip Bowman, uh, safe to great. We're on a mission to make organisations safe for great work. Um, there's lots of ways. I've got lots. I'm trying to find people who. Um, who want to read the book, get inspired, want to work with their teams using the book. Uh, we've got lots of resources on the skip-bowman.com website. So you, there's lots of stuff we're giving away for free there if you get the book um, so that you can work with your teams on it. I mean, this is a, a an important idea. We've, I think, you know, the next seven years, we've got some big challenges with AI and with the, with the climate change issues, whether you like it or not some really big changes in our economies and how we make money and, and, and so on. So we're going to have to, we're going to have to really uh, work hard at being great leaders uh, for these new times. And leadership has changed. Like you're mentioning, it's digital uh, and it's many other things. And uh, I think uh, I'm hoping the book starts to answer that question. What is the future of leadership? And so check it out and uh, write to me if you've got any questions. I do a lot of work on LinkedIn. So that's another place to see what I'm doing. Safe, numeral two, great.com or skip hyphen bowman.com, either one, so you can get connected more, learn more, and as Skip said, get a lot of the resources that he's, free resources he's been talking about. So before we finish, the question that I like to ask all of you every episode is simply this, now what? What action will you take as a result of our conversation? What insights did you get? But that's not really enough. It's not like I had an idea. It's like, what am I going to? do what action are you going to take first what are you going to try how are you going to think differently about growth mindset and even though we've talked about growth mindset we've talked about actions to take and not just a way to think so uh how do you think what might you do to move yourself or your team from the comfort zone to the learning zone to the growth zone what have uh you learned today about how you can think and operate with psychological safety more dif- differently. Those are just a couple of things that I wrote. The challenge for you is to take action on what you learn, because if you do, and when you do, you'll get far better results. So Skip, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you for Big being pleasure. persistent in us to get the technology fixed. And uh, it was a pleasure to have you. Thanks for being here. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Really love the opportunity. And with that, everybody, that means this episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast is over. Uh, If it's your first, there's plenty more to see or listen to by going to wherever you listen to your podcasts or go to remarkablepodcast.com to see any of the past 400-odd 
episodes. But if you don't want to do that, just subscribe wherever it is you subscribe because next week we'll be back with another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We'll see you then.